Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast, your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment presented by Better Bee. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flottam. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thank you, Sherry. And a quick shout out to all of our sponsors whose support allows us to bring you this podcast each week without resorting to a fee-based subscription. We don't want that, and we know you don't either. Be sure to check out all of our content on our website. There you can read up on all our guests, Read our blog on the various aspects and observations about beekeeping. Search for, download, and listen to over 200 past episodes. Read episode transcripts, leave comments and feedback on each show, and check on podcast specials from our sponsors. You can find it all at www.beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for joining. Before we get going, I want to ask for your help. You can help us open a show by sending us an opening greeting, much like you've heard in prior episodes. Simply record yourself or a group of fellow beekeepers welcoming others to the podcast and email it to us. It's easy and fun to do, really. On today's episode, we are joined by Amelia Cadwell. Amelia is joining us to talk about a pest management approach called mating disruption. And no, it's not the poor timing of toddlers. This pest management technique is used by growers of nuts such as almonds and pistachios, citrus, vine, and vegetables. Essentially, mating disruption used non-toxic synthetic pheromones to confuse the male insect pest, so fewer pests actually pair up and reproduce. This reduces the need for hard chemical pesticide sprays, perhaps down to once or even zero times a year. Amelia grew up watching her grandfather's honeybees, later in life worked with a commercial beekeeper, and now, while as a hobbyist beekeeper, works with a company that produces and sells the synthetic pheromones for various crop pests. Amelia's clients include California almond growers. This is a fascinating and educational chat with someone who's working to produce pollinator, insect, and environmental exposure to hard, persistent chemical sprays. I hope your season is going well. Remember to monitor your varroa loads and treat accordingly. If you need to help to decide what to do with varroa, check with a local experienced beekeeper, your state extension service, or one of my go-to sources, the Honey Bee Health Coalition's Varroa Management Resource webpage. I will include a link in the show notes. Regarding treatments, stick with those which are industry approved. As the old saying goes, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. One last note, if you're interested in honey competitions, you only have a few more days as of the date of this episode's release to enter honey into the Good Food Awards Honey Competition. You can find details and entry requirements on their website. You can Google that or check the show notes. Okay, that's it. Kim's getting ready to join us and we'll be chatting with Almelia. But first, a quick word from our sponsors. Hey, beekeepers. Many times during the year, honeybees encounter scarcity of floral sources. As good beekeepers, we feed our bees artificial diets of protein and carbohydrates to keep them going during those stressful times. What is missing, though, are key components. The good microbes necessary for a bee to digest the food and convert it into metabolic energy. Only Super DFM Honeybee by strong microbials can provide the necessary microbes to optimally convert the artificial diet into energy necessary for improving longevity, reproduction, immunity, and much more. Super DFM Honeybee is an all-natural probiotic supplement for your honeybees. Find it at strongmicrobials.com or at fine bee supply stores everywhere. 
And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, their newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Sitting across the virtual table right now is Amelia Cadwell of Sutera. Their company works with integrated pest management and reducing the use of pesticides in uh, Central California of the growers. So, Amelia, welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I've been a long-time listener, a long-time beekeeper, and I'm very happy to be here. Well, <laughs> we're really happy to have you here. It's nice to meet you, Amelia. I have to admit... I don't have a lot of experience in something called mating disruptions, and I know that's kind of one of your strong suits out there. Can you give me an overview of how that works and why I should know more about it? Absolutely. Yeah. So mating disruption is essentially keeping insects from reproducing so that we don't have to spray them as much, right? So I came from the world of almonds because I used to work in commercial beekeeping and a pest that is very prevalent in almonds is a pest known as navel orange worm. And those buggers reproduce by essentially sending out a pheromone so that the other bug can find them, right? And they reproduce that way. With mating disruption, what we do is we produce copies of that pheromone that get distributed out into the orchards, and essentially it confuses the bugs so much that they can't reproduce. So it's a way of, of keeping, you don't have to spray as much, right, if, you know, if they, aren't, they aren't even breeding and if they aren't making babies. So the technology is honestly pretty brilliant. It's been around for about 30 years, and Sutera did pioneer that technology. There are, of course, other competitors out on the market now, but it's an incredibly important way to help reduce your heavy pesticide sprays. And in fact, even the Almond Board of California is actually requiring most growers to include that as part of their integrated pest management program now. What were you doing that led you to this point that got you interested in confusing bugs up in the air? <laughs> <laughs> confusing bugs for a living? You mean that's not a super standard job? That's that's news to me. <laughs> I have had an interest for a really long time in protecting our pollinators and protecting our, especially our bees. And I think part of that is because I'm a huge contrarian and growing up, my grandpa had a beehive in his backyard that he never let us go out to because he didn't want us to get stung. So I had this like huge interest because I wasn't allowed to, right? When I went to undergrad, I started the beekeeping program there because I actually wrote a grant proposal for a couple of hives and then I ended up getting it. So I was like, oh man, okay, I have to learn how to take care of these guys back at my undergrad, Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania. And I was just so hooked on it. I thought it was the most interesting, cool, meditative experience just from a hobbyist perspective, right? Of course, is how I started of just going through the hives one by one. And I taught myself to beekeep without gloves because I thought that would make myself move more slowly through the hive, like total hippie entry point to beekeeping, which is hilarious since I now work in like the hardcore <laughs> sector of agriculture. <laughs> but essentially, I just wanted to make an impact as, as much as I could in terms of helping reduce, reduce pollinators while helping to protect pollinators, specifically bees, because we are seeing such a massive decline. So in undergrad, I started a research projects on comparative policy between EU versus US, specifically on neonicotinoid regulation. So if people aren't familiar with neonicotinoids, they're a class of systemic insecticide that stays in the environment for a very long time. And they're not evil, but they do need to be managed. And that essentially the EU decided to do a three-year moratorium on saying, hey, we're not going to use this pesticide until we prove that it's not causing any harm. So the U.S. is on the same track to be reducing those pesticides. And I was really interested in the comparative policy. So I had a huge kind of academic interest, but then I wanted to work more directly in the field. So I Essentially, I was just trying my best to make an impact in agriculture, and I actually took a job with a National Geographic photographer named Joel Sartori to work on social media campaigns for pollinator awareness. And I was like, you know what? I am happiest like with my hands in a hive, like feeling like I'm doing real work on the ground and really getting my butt handed to me by industry. But I realized that was that was kind of where I was happiest. So I ended up taking this research and development position at a commercial beekeeping operation in Fresno in, gosh, I think it was 2018. 
and just kind of hit the ground running from there. There's, there's so much to learn in agriculture. I'm always learning something new and especially in beekeeping, as you guys know, of course, but it, it was really a very natural progression from working directly in, in, in industry to from trying to improve how, you know, how we treat our hives specifically at the commercial level. So I was trying to improve varroa mite treatments to trying to say, hey, what can I do on the grower side to be protecting the bees that are out there in the orchard? Because commercial pollination is going to happen anyway. Let's see if I can, you know, help reduce some of those sprays that are going out there because that that makes a huge difference (laughs) in terms of the survivability of hives that are out in the orchard. Are you working with all growers or do you specialize with almonds or oranges or another crop? So we work with a ton of different growers. My most of my comfortability is with almonds, pistachios, because it's navel orange worm. But Sutera works with citrus, stone fruit, veggies, obviously almonds and pistachios, grapes there. Anytime that a pest is something that reproduces with pheromones that we probably have we probably have a pheromone for it. So California red scale is a big deal for orange growers. Vine mealybug is something that the wine grape growers and table grape growers have to worry about. Those are the majority of the ones that I work with. But the most of the folks that I knew from, you know, previous lives were people from the almond industry. So that my my book of business for the most part is, is almond folks. No matter which one of those groups you're working with, that's got to be a tightrope dance every time you're going out there. You've got I have to worry about getting enough of this material into the air to disrupt mating, but not so much that they don't mate at all. Or if you goof one way, the grower is going to be mad. And if you goof the other way, the beekeeper is going to be mad. Like, you're just, like I said, you kind of dance in a tightrope there. Does that sound about right? It's usually all right because I'm working. I am hoping that my what I'm doing, what I'm helping growers with is is at large going to, or overall going to benefit the beekeeping industry. And I think that that, that that's accurate and that is the case. But for the most part, you know, we don't want a pest like navel orange worm to be reproducing at all. So it's, it's pretty, I would say on that front, it's pretty straightforward. So for something like navel orange worm, we have one puffer, it's an aerosol puffer and you have, it's one per acre and then you hang it and forget about it. And that's, that's pretty much it. So there's not, there's not too, too much to worry about there. I would say the, what we run into issue most are people that are like, oh, well, does it work, right? So I think that mating disruption is pretty widely adapted in industry. I think most, I don't want to speak incorrectly, but I think most broadly it's it's adapted extremely, extremely well in the pistachio industry specifically. But I would say most of what we run up against are people just saying, well, show me the science that it works. I'm like, okay, well, it's on thousands of acres in California. I'm not really sure how much more you want me to show you that it works. That's something that bothers me is people are like, let me see a trial on 10 acres to show me whether it works. And I'm like, okay, but this 50,000 acres of almonds that they've been using this on that it works on for the last 30 years, that's not enough. All right, sure. Let's get a trial. (laughs) Just so I can understand this, because it's a new field for me. So the mating disruption methodology that you're using is a replacement for the neotinicinoid type pesticides? Is that what you're focusing on? I wouldn't say it's a full replacement. I would say that it is. it definitely helps reduce. So obviously a grower wants to chat with their pest control advisor. I'm nobody's PCA, so I can't advise them to specifically do that. But we do have growers that, you know, since they've started using mating disruption, they can cut down to maybe one spray a year or no sprays. So it definitely does help reduce, but we, I can't say like, hey, this is a, an exact substitute because it isn't, right? If, if somebody has an orchard that's super duper infested, you know, maybe they're going to want to keep using those, those conventional products for a while, right? You know, because it, it is important to be sustainable and to protect the environment. And honestly, industry is going this way because every year something gets pulled out of the toolbox in terms of what we're allowed to use, chlorpyrifos just got pulled. So our tools are getting smaller and smaller. And eventually everybody's going to be using this, but I'm never just going to come in and say, hey, you need to totally change how you're doing things. Like I, w- I want my growers to be able to grow food <laughs> and I want them, you know, I want that to happen in a way that's sustainable for them in a business sense as well. I used to do apples a lot, acres and acres and acres of apples. And I'm kind of familiar with 
the mating patterns and the timing and the weather and last fall and this spring, all of the things that come into play with the eventual population of the pest I'm trying to control. So from your perspective, what kinds of things are you trying to make growers aware of so that their applications are most efficient, most effective, and least costly? Yeah, so specifically, at least in the almonds, I know, man, I know it's rough out there because the the prices of almonds are not fantastic right now. And that is a complaint that I get from a lot of growers is they're like, I'm just farming water this year. I can't even afford to farm. So a lot of times folks will, you know, try to cut corners, which I completely understand. But if you want to control your populations of navel orange worm, like it's really important to make sure that you are following a good sanitation program. So where you're going out and you're, or where you're going into the orchard and you're actually getting the mummies off of there. I think the UC standards are like, I think you can have two mummies. And for folks that don't know what mummies are, those are essentially the almonds that didn't come off during the shake when everybody harvests. But when those are sitting up there for the whole season, they're just food for your pests. Like, why would they go anywhere? It is free rent, free board. They're just hanging out there mating, having a field day. So it is important to make sure that you are setting aside you know, the resources to make sure that you're having a good sanitation as well. Cause I know, I know it's tough to make sure that you, that you do that because it, it is expensive. It's an annoying part of the process specifically for almond folks. But if you can just help yourself out and make sure that you have some form of sanitation in place, that helps a lot. Even if you're not sure if you're going to budget for, you know, what you're going to budget for product wise, like that, that is just making sure you're starting off on the right foot. I'm going to be following the weather and the pest population in my orchards because I'm sampling routinely. I know that they're either below, at, or above where I want them to be. And worst case scenario, I do everything right and I go out and I sample and I've got 20 times the number of bugs out there that I wanted to have out there because of all of the things that stop the chemicals, stop the process from working right. Is that Common, not common? Do people just just give up and say, I'm going back to where I started? I haven't seen too too much of that. I've seen some the other direction. I was working with a gentleman out in, he was near Visalia, and he had an orchard that was just overrun. Or yeah, it was an orchard because they were citrus. And he was like, nope, I want to keep it organic. Like, I'm going to use many disruption. And then he might have done an oil spray or something. I'm not totally sure. But he essentially got the California red scale population really, really reduced just using mating disruption and maybe some other things. But I feel like for the most part, I don't, I don't see too, too much of that. I hear about it, but oftentimes that's because folks aren't actually employing or deploying the product correctly. Sometimes folks will hang our puffers in the trees and then forget to turn them on, which is a bummer. <laughs> but that that actually does happen. So we'll we'll see stuff like that happen, and then we'll we'll have a field team that runs out and does a puff, puffer check. And we're like, oh man, your your devices aren't on. You know, that's that's probably why you're seeing that. But of course, if a grower is feeling like things aren't efficacious or they've done everything they could, and you know they're still not seeing that reduction, that would be really weird. And I would consider that. Like, hey, I'm running this up because this this shouldn't happen. And we would start like a customer concerns process for that because that that shouldn't be the case unless you just bought a bucket of product and left it sitting in your field without, you know, putting it on. From a grower's perspective, I, I own a thousand acres of almonds and I need to harvest as many of them as possible. The cost effectiveness of your project versus hardcore chemicals versus some sort of hybrid? Is there a hybrid, A? I mean, is there some way you can combine good mating disruption with touch-ups on pesticide applications to get your numbers down to where you want them? Does that, from a grower's perspective, is that how I'm doing the, I'm walking that tightrope? Yeah, absolutely. I think that as much I mean, some is better than nothing. I, I want everybody to at least try it, get some of their acres under mating disruption to some extent. There, of course, there are, there are shifting standards. So if you're working with a certifier like CCOF and you want to be organic, then you're pro- your, your toolbox is super limited. So you're going to have to use mating disruption most likely. 
and you aren't going to have much of the systemics to choose from. However, if you are a conventional, let's say, pistachio grower, and you're wanting to see reduction to your damages because they they get incentives. So if they have what's called grade sheets at the end of the season, and I think for pistachios, it's like below half a percent, they get a certain bonus. You like the product eventually ends up paying for itself, right? Because if it's, you know, however much per acre, and then you're getting that money back because your your almonds or your pistachios are making that grade, then it it makes sense, right? Because we can pretty much guarantee that the first year you're going to see 50% reduction in whatever your damage is. It does, it does end up paying for itself. And of course, there are so many different, there's multiple ways to skin a cat, but the, the, the reality is, is there's only a handful of conventional products that are still, you know, that growers can even still use. And I am in also in no way anti-pesticide. I think I saw a stat the other day that was something similar that we wouldn't I think it's like 50% of our, of our food it wouldn't even be possible without systemic pesticides of some sort. We just have to be using them in a smart way and, you know, reducing whenever possible and using what other products are on the market when possible as well. Because, of course, resistance is a huge issue because, I mean, products like, I don't want to name names, but there are, there are products out there that used to work really well. And now the pests have gained resistance towards them. And that's never going to happen with something like mating disruption. Well, that was my next question is, like all pesticides, a product that controls pests, whether it's a poison or a hammer and a nail, whatever you have it, do these things come and go? Do insects develop resistance to them? Or do I have to continue to either spray more concentrated or more often to make them work like they did when I first introduced them? Well, the great thing about mating disruption is it's not it's not, you know, dead or not dead, right? In terms of pests, it's either they reproduce or they don't. So it's never going to happen that the insects are going to get resistance towards birth control, right? Like, because that's what it is. It is bug birth control. <laughs> and it's it from a, <laughs> from a biological perspective, it's just, it's, it's not how it works. I think it's easier to tell also so let's say, and part of why some folks are still like, hey, well, does it even work? Is when you spray an herbicide, you can see a plant die, right? When you spray a pesticide, you can see the bugs die. Main disruption, it's just, there's, you know, you don't, you will hang your traps and you do your counts and you're not going to see as many bugs out and about. But no, it, we're, it's not going to, we're not ever going to run into a, a resistance issue towards what's essentially birth control, which is great. Well, there's some compensation. That's good to hear because that's the trick you mostly always get on with the pesticides. It's just more and more and more often and more often. And pretty soon, no matter how much you have, it doesn't work because they just laugh at you when you put it on. So, But what other crops are you looking at longer term to make this process effective? Obviously, I work with almonds because I haven't been able to be quiet about that. But we have... <laughs> products for vine mealybug, which is something that I've been working more this year with wine grape growers and table grape growers, which are totally different kinds of folks. That's also part of the what's super fascinating about ag is just working with different kinds of growers is they're, they're just totally different kinds of people. So I've been doing more up in Northern California with wine grape people. They tend to have larger budgets than the table grape people. So it's usually a bigger, it's usually an easier, you know, shoe in because they're like, yes, we want the Cadillac of, of mating disruption. Yes, we want Satera. But table grapes has been one that is, you know, they're more central, they're more central valley located. And I've loved working with those people. I've, I've found that a little closer to home because my first office was a trailer in Kerman County, which is like middle of nowhere in the middle of a raisin <laughs> vineyard with no AC. Sometimes it had AC, but usually it didn't. And our bathroom was a porta potty that had my coworkers in it, which were black widows, because I was like kind of the only person working out there for a while. So I, I mean, I, I love all the kinds of folks that I work with, but for the, the majority of my work has been with obviously the nut crop folks and then vine folks as well. But we're doing a little bit more work with veggies and developing some products for fruit as well. So that is that is coming up on the pipeline. And then we work a lot with growers up in the Pacific Northwest as well with almonds, 
or not almonds, sorry, apples, the other A1, and then citrus. So we have tons of citrus in the Central Valley. I, for whatever reason, don't work as much directly with citrus. I'm well-versed on it. I understand it. I can talk to Aurora about their citrus program. But for whatever reason, my I've primarily been working with almond folks and then more of the, the vine people as well. But we also have stuff for stone fruit, so like peaches and cherries and those folks, which are also going to be a little more Central Valley located. Let's take this opportunity to take a quick break, and we'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. Better Bee is proud to be the main sponsor of Beekeeping Today podcast. To keep beekeepers like you informed on industry news, fresh beekeeping tips, and new-to-market products. To celebrate our growing partnership and to give you, our listeners, a sweet deal for a limited time, you can get a free Bee Smart Uncapping Slicer with your purchase of $25 or more. Shop at BetterBee.com and use code POD, P-O-D, at checkout. This deal is good through midnight Eastern time on June 30th, 2023. Amelia, this just begs the question, is there a workman's compensation clause for black widow spiders in your potty? (laughs) I couldn't resist that. You know what? And you don't have to answer. There really should be. There really should be. I was working for a startup and I didn't know much about workman's comp. So it was one of those those classic jobs where I'm just very thankful to have health insurance. We'll, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the mating disruption would be good for the black widow spiders. You could sell a lot of those with all the little honey buckets around the countryside, I think. <laughs> Man, you're not kidding. If, if they reproduce that way, absolutely. I'd be the first one on top of that. That's for sure. <laughs> I've been dying to ask you because we originally tried to get you on. Oh, when was it? Back in March, I believe. We tried to get you scheduled. And then we had all that weather disruption in Southern California and the West Coast. I'd like to ask you your perspective and what you saw, what you experienced, what you know the growers experienced. Because many of the beekeepers are through the spring especially along the West Coast, experienced the fallout from the weather situation in the almond orchards in uh, California with the package seasons and and then the queen disruptions. So can you describe a little bit about the weather disruptions? Yeah, absolutely. That that was wild. I'll tell you that much. I would go on calls and I was on my way to Bakersfield and then there just wouldn't be a road. So I ran into that pretty frequently this season. and. You know, I'm I feel like a glorified truck driver sometimes because all of my all of my my growers are so far apart. So I do a ton of driving. I'm I'm a very good driver, but man, those are that is some of the scariest driving I have done is just, you know, realizing that everything is just completely washed out. And I have pictures from like pulling up to where I was supposed to be and there's like an SUV on its side and like just completely no road and the cops are like, oh, you're the big truck, head on through. I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I think I'm good, <laughs> thank you. But yeah, it was honestly a very scary and sad time and I felt like I needed to tread really lightly and I did <laughs> tread very lightly with, with my folks because, man, what do you say, you know, when somebody's orchard is just completely underwater or their house is gone, you know? It was very disrupting har har to, you know, a lot of what I had going on because I have tons of my work is really just going out and talking to folks about their pest management programs and seeing how I can make that better. And there's not really a time to do that tactfully when there's a crisis, right? So that it was just a really weird and sad time, to be honest. So I spent a lot of time really just checking on folks and saying, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> how can I help? You know, or or just leaving people alone. I mean, you kind of figure out what what people would want from you. I have, I have growers that I know that would love to hear from me and I have growers that I know would love to be left alone. So really just from a social perspective, it was very like, oh, okay, like let's, let's contribute and help how, how best I can. But for the most part, kind of just let let people be because I mean there were folks that were getting evacuated by boat and these are in dry dry areas or if you told me that a year ago I'd be like what are you talking about no way but I mean because everything's so flat it floods for an inch it goes forever right so yeah 
that's one of the struggles of living in a place where you can watch your dog run away for a week because it's just so (laughs) (laughs) I hadn't heard that. Amelia, we've talked about the past, the present, the future, various different crops and the way they are produced or not produced using mating disruption and some of these other techniques. What have we missed that growers and beekeepers need to know about all of this? I think communication between the grower and the beekeeper is is really key. I have a list of like 10 things that I that I tell my growers to try to do to help protect their beekeepers or help protect their bees specifically. And one of them is, you know, I always see hives that are placed really close to the highways. If more growers made a stink about it and just got them placed like 50 meters back in the row, that would help a lot because I, I know that a lot of folks, we drive our F-150s and we get bees just completely painted across our windshields. So that's a tip that I would love for, you know, if growers made more of a stink about hive placement, it would it would help a lot, I think. Additionally, just doing things like, hey, let's plant cover crop. There's there's this, what I call a cover crop fallacy, where there's, there's this idea that if you plant cover crop, the bees are going to be attracted to that and they're not going to pollinate your almonds efficiently. That is super untrue. The bees actually prefer the almond pollen. It's very nutrient dense. The anthers on the pollen of an almond are actually, it's easier for them to reach. The bees, it's easier for them to reach. So they're actually going to be more attracted to that. And when bees are placed out there in, you know, February, March, there's not enough forage out there for them to survive. So, you know, plant cover crop if you're a grower, try to have the hives not placed so close to the highway, put water out, communicate with your beekeeper when you're spraying. And then if you do spray, spray at night, you know, the bees are at home then. So I'm a big fan of harm reduction and, you know, just making sure that you're communicating and, you know, none of this is rocket science. It really is just very sensible (laughs) tips in terms of what I, what I encourage my growers to do, the ones that are, that are sustainably minded. There's also tons of funding available. There's tons of funding available for cover crops. I work specifically with the folks at the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and I also help connect growers through funding through them and through USDA as well. So there's tons of ways and there's tons of resources if you're a grower and you're interested in improving your pest management, or if you're interested in planting cover crop or you know, becoming more bee friendly, there are tons and tons of resources out there. So really just kind of paying attention and using what's available. Well, that may not be rocket science, but it's certainly very, very, very good advice. I insist that people write down some of those things because it's the best information I've heard in a long time. Well, Amelia, we really appreciate you being on the show today to talk about what the growers are doing to use, do something other than pesticides in the orchards. And it's been a pleasure talking to you on Beekeeping Today podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really great chat with you guys. And I hope you can come back sometime down the road a little bit and see how this is progressing, both with being used in the industry and what other industries are beginning to pick up on it. It's very encouraging. Absolutely. It's really interesting to get the grower's perspective on the beekeeping industry and the tools that they have available to help control pests, as opposed to just uh, what we always think as being spray and kill the insect. To me, this is exciting. Like I said earlier, I've spent a lot of time growing apples, acres and acres and acres of apples, and I know the problems that you can run into and the weather, and suddenly all my help isn't showing up, and suddenly it's raining and it's not supposed to be, and all of the things that can go wrong. If I could take all of those things and then reduce the pest population by 80%, I wouldn't care hardly at all about all of the rest of the things that could go wrong. So to me, this is exciting, and I can see a lot less poison being put into the environment and a much better product being able to be produced by the growers. I kept wanting to ask Amelia, and besides it's outside of her field, but it'd be great to have that mating disruption approach available for the Varroa. I'm sitting here trying to think of how you would make that work, but I'm I'm guessing somebody out there is going, oh, I know how I could do that. Yeah, it's called a brood break, I think. (laughs) When When that person gets that idea, speak up, because there's somebody out there looking for something to do to fix Varroa. They'll make a billion, that's for sure. At least, yep. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. 
Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on the reviews along the top of any web page. We want to thank our regular episode sponsors, Global Patties, Strong Microbials, and Better Bee for their longtime support of this podcast. Thanks to Blue Sky Bee Supply and Northern Bee Books for their generous support. Finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to leave us questions and comments at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.